call the meeting to order at 9.02 uh, to call, uh, to do roll call. Erica? Uh, Tom Lee? Yep. Arlene Zorzman? Here. Josh Jansky? Here. Uh, Carrie Snow? Here. Jenna Reed? Here. Glenn Pepper? Here. And then staff, we have Molly O'Donnell here, Lauren Sellers here, and Kendra Daniels here. All right, next up on the agenda is the approval minutes from our March 12, 2024 meeting. Do I have a motion? I'll move. Okay, so I have a second. We've got a motion and a second. Um, any discussion on this? All right. No, changes are good. Let's have a vote. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Or raise your hand. <laughs> um, any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, motion passes. Number three, public invited to be heard. Anybody from the public? Nope. Number four, organizational updates. So I don't have any today. I'm going to hear open staff. You might want to mention anything. Right. But I think. Um, well, actually, we can mention we do have a couple hires coming. So we did hire a new community manager for the suites. Jonah started yesterday. Um, so getting that onboarded. And then we are waiting for our clinician positions to post. That is going through the city HR budget approvals process in the financial system now. And I believe that's our only change, right? So it's last month. And then we're um, getting ready to interview some people for the maintenance. We certainly have a change. Mm -hmm. um, we hired from within the maintenance supervisor, hired Patrick Bryan mm -hmm. to take that position. Um, so he started a yeah, week ago. Yeah. Um, and so we have opened up the maintenance position at Spring Creek and Fall River to backfill him. Because that's where he was before. That's where he was. Yeah. So there are impact updates. I'm coming back from my mask. I left my mask upstairs. I might. Um, and of course, the next item is mine. That was, I'm just coming off of a cold and I feel fine, but I was going to do that as a prevention for you all. So I'll go run up and then get it in a moment. We'll just blame you if we get sick. Yeah. <laughs> it was very mild. It wasn't that bad. But. Uh, so, number five in development project updates? Um, so, I think what we have going on at the moment we have a Village on Main under construction. Um, that is going well. We just moved the second phase back in. So we're getting to the point where people have lived in the first phase for about six weeks. They've been back for about six weeks. And we're getting down to the nitty gritty. We're talking, um, you know, there is no such thing as a perfect project. And so we're going, uh, working actively with residents right now to go over all the little stuff that they didn't necessarily think of at first, but now they're they're living in it and having little tweaks they like or questions about certain things. So um, we are working a lot with residents right now to make sure that everybody gets their um, needs satisfied or we help explain why that a certain request can't be granted. Um, so we're doing that a lot right now at Village. Um, we're about to start working the lobby I think they started hanging up um, the plastic in the lobby uh, to do work in the atrium area yesterday. Uh, the plastic is to keep because it's going to be quite dusty. So um, we're trying to keep the dust down as much as we can, but that common area work is starting. Exterior work won't be until at least the end of May. Um, so we are rocking and rolling there. Um, most of the feedback that the residents think the units are beautiful and we're addressing all the little stuff. But overall, everyone has said that the ho we've had no complaints about the hotel stays, and then people are generally super happy with the improvements in their apartments. So that's the update there. Um, and then doing a lot of work on Hover right now on Ascent at Hover Crossing, um, really trying to get to that July closing date. So there will be a flurry of things between now and July. Um, going to, to the board, coming through here, um, doing final design tweaks because building permit applications have been submitted um, and really trying to get ready for closing. So there'll be a lot of mo money moving in the next two months. Um, we're also waiting to hear about from Colorado Health Foundation about the funding for the Early Childhood Education Center. It, it does appear we are getting an award 
they are just fine tuning the milestones for, that they would like us to meet. And so we're waiting to hear the big news and how much the award will be. Um, the remaining gap as of today is $2 million. We've got the Colorado Health Foundation we requested $2 million from. Um, and then we also still are having conversations with the Longmont Community Foundation because they do want to help as well. Um, and we're just going to see how all the puzzle pieces get together. So all of that is quite active at the moment. Um, we're going to be, Zinnia is going extremely well in construction. It's on time. And we're, we started the lease up conversations, um, getting the entire team working together to plan for that. Lease up is expected to start, actual move-ins are expected to start in about October um, and go as long as it takes. But Bluebird Boulder, which is the sister project to this one that just finished construction in December, they leased up in 30 days. And so um, we're lucky that we're coming in right after that one because there's lots of lessons learned. It's virtually the same team, except for switching out Longmont Housing Authority um, on that, on our project. And so there's a lot of lessons that they came back with after the Bluebird lease up to, to get us going very smooth. So we're prepping for that. We're going to talk about other suites um, area in just a moment, so I'll hold that one. And then generally talking to um, the developers of Atwood Commons. If you recall, Atwood Commons came in at about the same time as Ascent asking for city funds. And they went in for um, LIHTC awards at the same time and were not successful. So they're preparing to resubmit in August. So we're helping, um, we're talking with them about how to strengthen their application. And so if there's anything regarding that to come bring back, that will happen between now and August. And we're working on a bunch of ideas that are keep flying at us, um, keeping contacts with partners like MGL, who's continuing to try and work in long run on future stuff. Um, just keeping those conversations going to see what could be for our further out future pipeline. So that's the development of things. So I have anything I just okay. any questions at all? So on item number six, items for input uh, from LHA, uh, for the LHA Board of Commissioners, suites and land conferences. Okay, so something that will be coming to the Board of Commissioners, uh, most likely at the May meeting, is an easement for the construction of the Dry Creek Trail, which would go behind the suites. This has been a trail connection that's been in plan for a very long time. Um, the Easement, the land behind the suites is owned jointly by the city and the LHA. And so if it was city to city, that's a, kind of a separate story. They don't really need an easement from themselves, even if it's different divisions of the city working on the trail and versus the ownership of the land. But we would need to record an easement against the land for LHA. And because there is an active option agreement with element properties to do future work back there. So going back a little bit, the history on that, when um, LHA was trying to get Fall River built in about 2018, they uh, approached the city to try and sell off or have the city buy into the back portion of the land, including where Zinnia was, so the back and the side. So they couldn't close on the loan at Fall River because they didn't have enough cash based on where they were sitting at that time and so that then triggered trying to find solutions which um, this was the solution that, that we kind of narrowed in on so the city paid the city's affordable housing funding seven hundred fifty thousand um, and I it's, it's kind of odd if you can go to the Boulder County Assessor oh and I'm not sharing it either just one second I'll get on the assessors and then share for you or
So, so, the city for seven hundred and fifty thousand purchased all of this, and so if you see this, so this is when you look at the property, city of Longmont at all. So we own the majority. The city owns the majority interest in the property. Uh, and has full operational control of the decisions on the property. And the reason that was created is this was before um, the merger. And so what we wanted is, is if we were putting 750, we didn't want the housing authority to block an affordable housing project that the city was interested in. And so in that agreement, you know, can't be unreasonably withheld. But we have the, the city has the majority interest in this. So. And so that so the building there is a suites, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And then where's, and then where's any in relation to right that? Right there. So originally that, it was plot, right? originally it was um one yeah. property altogether. Yeah. And then we split Zinia yeah. off as part of that deal. Okay. So this is what's left. So, so yeah. is this because I know that there are people down there who have complained about the fact that they can't get over the village in the peaks. Is this going to give them a, a way to get over yes. there? The, the trail connection will, yes. So the, the trail connection, if you want to go back and then you need to share again. Well, let me show you. The trail connection will show on this concept. So let me share this one. So here's the, here's the trail. This is very high level concept version of the trail here. These two connections, it's just gonna be one. It'll be either this one or this one, but because this is still in concept plan. But there will be one connection to that trail that leads into the central area of the, the properties. So the easement will be coming to the board because Parks is ready to begin construction this year on that trail connection. So but in preparing for that, we had to have conversations with Element about, okay, so the trail, here is the trail, here's our easement that is needed for that. We negotiated the size of the easement, um, really trying to make sure we didn't shoot ourselves in the foot later with what we could develop on that back land. And it turns out we came to a win-win solution where everyone is, is getting kind of the maximum that they could, could get out of this. But what um, with the option agreement, which is with the city, but Element needs to start planning work back here. According to the option, they need to obtain a LIHTC award on this back lot by the end of 2025 in order for this option to hold as is. Um, and this easement, we were reviewing the option to see if this easement would trigger anything and other than consent from Element, which we essentially already have, um, that it wouldn't trigger any changes. But Element does want us to start talking, us meaning the city and the LHA, talking about what we want to do back there so they can start planning for that. Um, and so at some future time coming soon, we're going to be bringing this conversation to the board as well and then working with the city too since it's a big, big mix of people. But we wanted to start the conversations um, to start getting a you know, seed planted in mind about what we would like to see happen back there. According to this, there, there's a building is feasible that serves about 63 units. Um, that's not really specific to any sort of unit mix yet. It's just a bubble with a number of floors, but um, we need to start thinking about this so Element can start planning for a light type of work in 2025. So if we put another building back there, does that mean it's gonna be pretty much the same population as at Suites? That's the decisions that we need to make. There are options. When we originally talked about this, I think one of the things that the, the, the council at the time and now the board have talked about is wanting to create maybe not permanent supported housing here, but maybe uh, the next layer up of affordable housing so that there's, um, again, when we went to visit that place in uh, Denver, Aurora Village. Village is sort of showing this process that you can go through. 
get out of permanent supportive and move into, you know, affordable housing. Um, the council's also talked about part of what they had at that facility was the Dolores House, which was um, which was a, 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 a more of a shelter, but a shelter connected to permanent supportive housing and affordable housing. Again, what they indicated is the success rate was pretty was higher than normal because as people were adjacent to housing and they were seeing the movement in. But it was there, and so those are things that they'll need to think about um, in terms of what they want to do. So a lot of decisions to be made, but to your point, you know, there's a certain point where we need to look at diversifying uh, the different, you know, different populations there, or all of a sudden, the, you know, what, what's the unintended consequences of right that? More for the individuals with success, uh, so that they can be more successful. So some things to consider is this is not in a QCT, which is that Dolores House model, one of the critical success factors was it was in a QCT so that the shelter itself could be included in tax credit basis. We don't have that option here. So if it was going to be something like that considered, there would have to be other funding going in. If it was something more like the um, transitional to the next phase up, that obviously the units would be could be like uh, light tech eligible. We've also talked about including enough commercial or flex space to, pro to provide services, office space for services. So those are just some things we've talked about so far. Um, but if this board wants to make a recommendation to, to the LHA, this is what we want to start thinking about. And it's all, it's, it is in an enterprise zone, which I think we need to get better <coughs> at figuring out how to bring enterprise zone into the affordable housing process because um, people that support organizations that do work in an enterprise zone with that tax deduction, if the project is qualified through, I think it's OA. So there's a different revenue model, and I think we're going to have to figure out how to utilize that for our projects. Um, on the other side of it, the reason the trail makes sense is because but for the city doing it as part of the connection, um, if we develop that back lot, then we're actually required as a developer to play the trail. So between the trail work that they're doing and the landscaping, that actually is a cost savings to the development of that back parcel because that's not something that we have to do in the mix. And there's, within the easement, that may, count the, towards the project's open space requirements, so if you see some pocket parks here and such, um, we might be able to count that. So there's some advan advantages for both sides on this. So I think I'm really happy we were able to come to a place where nobody had to really give up something they wanted, <coughs> or the easement itself. So where, do you know where the trail goes to? Where are the endpoints? Um, sunset, and then it connects into, oh. let me go back to the other. see that there's already a sidewalk here um, at the Village of the Peaks. So it'll connect there and then those individuals can take the internal sidewalks where you could actually then go under Hover and then connect to the west side of Hover. Um, and then it'll go all the way and, I, uh, and then it just connects it to six right. for the for the transit, you know, things like that. So they'll get over the hook. They'll be able to get over the hook for easier. Mm -hmm. yeah. So nice yeah. And it's strictly walking. Well, or biking. Or walking, yeah. biking. Yeah. You know, just um, bike. It's a bike that trail. Mm -hmm. Are there any initial thoughts on desires for this development? Or do you want to ruminate and come back if you want to make a recommendation to the board once we're ready to bring it? Wait, so, so it sounds like we got one of two possibilities. This is kind of the, before the housing that we're offering now, 
before or the after, perhaps, like with the next step level, right? That's kind of the, the two different options. Yeah. Or, I mean, you could even look at insert family housing. I mean, I know that was one of the original thoughts. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of ideas of it thrown out. Um, Element, of one, a long time ago, talked about working with Together, which works with youth exiting homelessness. Um, there was talk about family housing, because that's what the, our city needs assessment shows is the top thing. Um, the Boulder Shelter has said, you care, you know, there's these theory, theories that go with it too, and philosophies of you can don't over concentrate without doing it very well. Like this campus mode is an idea that it has to be done very well. Um, and then there's also like, there's a, there's a market to consider here too in terms of there's it's super there's access to employment and commercial and now a trail um, but also we want to see what it's just an odd space right it's not part of a more established residential neighborhood although there is a residential proposed for up across the district right? Yeah, the market. so it is a changing area, so I'm sure that our market study would show us some stuff too, meaning the market study that Element would do to prepare for this, so. And Zinnia is mental health partners, right? This is gonna be- They, the, they administer the vouchers. The vouchers and Boulder, the, shelter Boulder Shelter administers services. Okay. Oh, cool. And helps with the, you know, the uh, coordinated entry and bringing that, the people off out of the system. So, well, I think it would be nice to think to you know think about it a little bit. And I don't know if you guys could send us a little blurb that says here's your options type thing or something like that, mm -hmm. and then come back and uh, uh, that's my two cents. Yeah, at one point in the early design threats, we actually looked at theoretically um, similar to what you have down here by Libby. I don't know if you've seen the small townhomes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, one of the early designs that we talked about was actually adding something like that for family housing. Again, diversifies the housing stock. And, um, but we'll have to see. Yeah, I think we need to see what it's like once we finish in here. And, that might be part of the market study. Yeah. Um, I think safety is a good one. Yeah. 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 Hey, this is Josh. Just going back to that schematic, I think there was a note that it said that there's currently 150 parking spaces per 200 units. If you change the use, like you guys are thinking about or kind of talking about, does that change your requirement? And if so, um, you know, it, that's a pretty tight site, it looks like to me. So what's interesting is parking is, and uh, parking generally for affordable is something that is staff is on the city side is preparing to take to council. They've taken an initial discussion to council on it here a few weeks ago. Um, when it comes to permanent supportive housing, a lot of studies are showing that they are severely overparked, meaning they have way more parking than necessary, which we've seen at the suites um, with before we had construction going on, how empty it was. Uh, some of the, the ranges go from either 0.15 parking spaces per unit up to 0.6 or so, but nowhere near one to one, meaning one unit per, park, per, per apartment. And so there's a, depending on what use we put in and what type of housing, we'll have, be looking at a mix because we'll have 82 plus 55 of permanent supportive housing and they're showing it right now at 0.75 per dwelling unit, which is still quite high. Mm -hmm. So yeah. parking is something to certainly look at and see how this, how the math all adds up. But so far parking at this site has not been a concern with the space that we have. Yeah, even when we did the parking study, we, we looked at different affordable housing projects and market rate housing. And it was really interesting. Christman one was one that we looked at, which is um, a 60% AMI park project. It was 
it's 50 percent hard and so and that's kind of a trend that we're seeing and the reason they look at Brisbane um, specifically was really because that's most of ours are actually age restricted which creates a, brings a different component into this and so yeah they I think they looked at Southern Park as well or, uh, I think that one was too new um. anyway they and, and we're definitely seeing the trends that you know 50% tends to be what we're seeing in terms of parking or lower. Sorry, what about free for a TV? Yeah. What about visiting parking? Uh, we yeah. always plan in yeah. some visitor parking. There's a. I mean, you said it's 50%. Did it so that includes that visitors. That includes visitors. Yeah, that's all wrapped and, in. And like 50% of the parking lot is empty at any given time. Yeah. What well, you your family housing trips? Maybe more of the same yeah, so that's why we have to tweak it based on whatever type we end up putting there. Yeah, and I think the thing, you know, parking is you know, an interesting one that, that, that Josh brought up is so we're putting out our RFP for uh, microtransit and it may be obviously. Um, and that's creating microtransit, we're working in conjunction with buses. Uh, so that your bus routes become more efficient, but basically it reduces the travel time. I may have said this to you all, and if I did, I apologize. Um, one of the companies that does this, we looked at like Montgomery, Alabama, and all these other places. They literally took, on a bus, it took 30 minutes to get from where you live to where you work. They came in with microtransit, or used to be. And so, one of the things that we're not quite sure about that we're going to have to learn through the parking and all of this is really once we implement microtransit it actually makes it easier for people not to have a car within the system and um, especially when you look at even at market rate people that are struggling to pay market rate you know, qualify, you know you will see people slide down and i think go to one car if the transit system really works for them um, and then with the, the rail legislation that's been there for now, you know, within, you know, if it passes, let's say it's been three to five years, and we have a service from Fort Collins to Denver, and you have microtransit, and you have this, that need changes. And so, how we think of parking is probably going to be evolving over the next few years. Hell, I'm sorry, I put the time, but I don't want to know what microtransit is. So, think of um, a different version of Uber and Lyft um, in that instead of like when you call Uber they come and pick you up and then they take you what microtransit may do is to say we'll pick you up at the corner of let's say in our neighborhood 21st and Olympia so I, I walk the block they pick me up and then they'll go pick up Warren then they'll pick up our lead and then they just start dropping you off so it's like this combination of a bus and, and is Uber. It private or not is it private? It's public? private. So that's why we're doing an RFP. So then they'll run it. There's a cost to it. And then we'll look at the cost structures based on income qualifications, which we already have different things in our system. So everyone will have to get something, but what you pay is, will vary based on your income. And, uh, and so there, yeah, there's like two or three companies that are doing this all over the world, and almost everywhere they're doing it, it's taking off because it just um, they know both systems aren't working. It's just within one line. Correct. So like, if you need to get to Denver, you don't have a bus stop near you, but you're going to take a bus to Denver. You use the micro transit for like that first last mile issue yeah. to get you to where you need to jump on the regional bus. So like right now, it'll take you to the Roosevelt Building. When we finish construction of the transit station, it'll either take you there or it'll take you to catch the bus that may be running up and down Main Street, depending on where you're where you're living, and then you just connect into the system. So that changes kind of. I mean, as we're evolving and looking at projects, these other pieces are going to change how we look at the projects. Is that going to be subsidized by the city? Yep, at least initially. And we just got a million dollar 
um, grant from Congressman Nagus and, and put that in the appropriations. Uh, we also have um, a grant from RTD and their innovative transportation systems. So it's about four, so I'd say about a million there, and then we'll get our transit fund. Um, and then once we can evaluate the business case and how it works, then we can talk to RTD about the cost sharing model because it may reduce their operating costs. So the first three years we're going to be really testing this out. I was just wondering from the Washington News last night why you were in a lift call and how it really happens. And the cost. Hmm. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's consistent with like, uh, what RTD does now. Is it flex ride? Somewhat similar kind with of, that? Yeah, but, it's kind of like yeah. flex ride. But um, it's, a, it's a little more reliable because right. we're like out moving. It's yeah. not. Uh, that's where the Uber and Lyft is on again. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. so. so right now, where is the closest bus stop to here? Is it on Sunset? sunset? It's on, I think, Sunset and where Sunset and uh, 119 meet. So you have to go out and around right. to get to it. Or you could cut through Village of the Peaks, but right now that is a challenge. And frankly, a lot of the folks who need transportation here, those that can't make it, they probably should be using an accessor ride or something else because of the mobility issues. So maybe I'll put another agenda item to circle back. I'll put the, together a blurb of the options that have been discussed so far. Yeah. That does not, that's not all encompassing. And we can get even more creative if we got brain power. All right. Um, Molly, sorry, one more question just yep. on the And that all makes complete sense about how the current sites are going to be over park. Um, but you'll have to have some for phase three. And so I assume that you'd have to have some kind of a shared parking agreement with Zinnia or yeah. the suites. Do you guys foresee an issue with the partnership agreeing to that? Or the, like, I don't, I don't have any idea what that process really looks like. And if you have to go back to the original equity provider to get there, approval and is it time to maybe find that seat now? We did do a shared use agreement at, ahead of Zinnia. Um, when it came to, it wasn't specific to parking, I'm trying to recall exactly what it was for, but there's our, the, the model has been used so far for Zinnia and the suites, and so we would hope to replicate that. And really the, I mean this parking, can you see my cursor? I'm not sure if you can. The yeah, park, I can. Okay, the parking in this, um, southeast corner that is still on suites property but zinnia residents are going to use it um, they're not going to only be restricted to coming back here i mean it's going to be open parking for the campus so we'll make sure to plan for that ahead of time as needed i'll let you know that the very high level concept plan for this entire campus also includes a building in the southeast corner that is completely not planned out at all, has no option agreement similar to this phase three at all. But there is room for another building. Again, we gotta then look at making sure we have the parking situation figured out, but um, that is a potential for someday. Okay. Uh, please. Yep, thank you, Josh. I want to be the voluntary compliance screen updates. Okay, I've been working on this quite heavily for the last couple months. So the voluntary compliance agreement was executed, they, the LHA had been working on it for oh, quite a while and the city was assisting um, and then it was finally executed in 2020 and uh, the when the city and LHA came together the groups the staff to, from both sides worked on um, all but one of the items all the way through 2021 and the last item that I came on and picked up when Kathy retired was performing the uh, property conditions assessments for 
accessibility for all the properties and um, using HUD's format and UFAS standards to hire a third party um, consultant to go through and do an independent analysis and list all the deficiencies and a seven year timeline for fixing them. And so we did that and finished that in early, at the end of 2022 and submitted that to HUD. Um, and this was the last deliverable on that voluntary compliance agreement. And then HUD hung on to it for about 10 months. And in November of 23, they um, came and said, we want to see more things. Um, honestly, the UFAS standards were written in the 80s and they have not changed since. And so interpreting those regulations is a very interesting job. Um, and so they wanted to see things that we did not include, like water fountains and dumpsters and much more nitty gritties. So since November, we brought back in that consultant and redid the assessments, going to that extra level for HUD, and we just submitted those back to them um, April 1st. And so we are now in the waiting game again for HUD to review those and hopefully sign off that they are complete. And then that would complete the deliverables of the voluntary compliance agreement. Um, however, like we have seven years to complete the improvements, so we're always going to have to be reporting to HUD during that time. But it wouldn't be, we have met the checklist of items that we have to complete for this agreement. So I'm crossing fingers that we are able to sign off here soon, however long it takes them to actually look at it, um, to sign off on that VCA. But what I wanted to give you a sense of is the amount of work that we need to do to have these properties be 100% up to UFAS standards for interiors and ADA and UFAS for interior commons and exterior. Um, so when does the seven years actually start? It, uh, it started, we, we started it in 2023. 2023. That's when we started it, because that's when we submit the original report. Okay. So we started doing corrections throughout 2023. And we've got a, um, a shared worksheet with maintenance where they go in, they do it, take a photo, verify it, enter it into the thing so that when at the end of each year, that consultant comes back and checks those corrections and certifies that they're done correctly. So we will have him on board for quite some time. So here is our total corrections as valued by this consultant. And we know that these are not actual costs because when we started doing the work and went out and get concrete bids, for example, they were about five times higher than what the consultant put in because uh, he's using just standard you know, blue book stuff. But generally to get a scale for the amount of work that the properties need to do over the next seven years to get completely compliant. Um, it was $350,000 worth of work. And to date, which really is in the first year, we've completed 158 and that would not have been possible without accessing the city's CDBG and ARPA grants. Um, Cause we did some of the bigger ticket items that LHA staff would never be able to just do on our own. Um, it needed to be contracted work. So we've completed about 45% of that work already course, considering that some of that is priced uh, based off of blue book values, but um, just wanted to give you a sense of what we've completed and then what we still have to do. We did complete most of the big ticket work. There's a couple big ticket items left, which I'm trying to, while we still have access to CBG CV funds through the city, I'm trying to see if we could work out some funding swaps on the back end to help make that happen, because uh, those would be big hits to the property budgets. A lot of them are very small things that just require maintenance labor. We just need to, to space them out and do them over time. Um, so, it's Village on Main completed. Okay, got it. Yeah, Village on Main is getting completely done with the rehab. So he is the same consultant we have on board to come and do punch walks with us and sign off as we go. So it will be 100% done. Carrie, what was your question? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, sort of like <coughs> Yeah. Let me give you a little little recap of the, the key points there. 
615 main we prioritized because we sold it. So we completed that work um, before we sold it. Um, that was more of a, a um, good partnership decision. It wasn't a requirement of the sale, but. Well, to be frank, we didn't want to sell. Center for people with disabilities. Center for people with disabilities <laughs> or properties that didn't have accessibility. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, That's that more of a moral, the yeah. moral thing. Yeah. Um, I will also say that a lot of these completion percentages are based on not necessarily the number of corrections, but if you have concrete work worth $25,000 and then $6,000 of small improvements all added up, if you complete the one concrete work, you're going to show that it's actually very far complete, but there's still a lot of numbers of things to do. Um, so that's why 1228 main is at 90% because we did a big concrete ramp. Um, and then like Fall River didn't, I'm sorry, Spring Creek didn't have any concrete work to do. So that's all, more of a bunch of little things. So that's why it looks way low. And then um, the Lodge and Hearthstone, when you look at the list for Lodge and Hearthstone, Kelvin, our maintenance, um, maintenance tech there, he's actually completed a ton of items, but they were the little one-off ones. And then the Lodge has one big concrete project left, which is why it looks behind from compared to Hearthstone. But if you looked at the lists, He's been hitting yeah. a ton of items. So okay. it's a little bit, there's stories behind the numbers for sure. So then the need is kind of underestimated because of like the concrete. I would say yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. But but some of them, like he, he puts in costs for labor. If Kelvin goes and does it, it doesn't actually cost us anything, but it, it has value to the improvement. So it's a little bit, it's not the most perfect calculation, but it still gives us an idea of the level of work that he's done. So this is more what what we're working on in the background is to try and get these done as soon as we can, but also considering staff capacity and then in some instances for the big ticket items pumping capacity. Okay. And ideally we want to complete these as soon as possible, but we have until twenty thirty then to mm -hmm. get it done. Right. Yeah. Okay. I mean, completing forty five percent of it in the first years, we wanted to show HUD that we're taking this seriously, we're not blowing this off. So also please just accept this. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> but that, that, that's actually pretty good um, progress in one year. So that was that was the update. So according to the LHA side, we have fulfilled the voluntary compliance agreement for this waiting for HUD to give us final word and continuing to do projects. Let's go on to number seven, anything for the resident quality of life? Nothing from staff. Um, I do have an update on the CARES program. Um, we had that meeting yesterday with the CARES team at the city, and so we're going to have um, a representative from the city at the Coffee and Conversations tomorrow, the suites, to help residents who qualify for those services, the grocery rebate, um, to help them get that going. Um, there will be some ongoing work to help get the LHA residents and then the larger housing trust voucher residents and any other voucher holders which are not um, qualified for that program. There's some changes that have to be made on the home side for the program, but um, yeah, we got that conversation. Going to number eight, the LHA report, update on operations, operations report. So we have we have our usual vacant units that are for math. Uh, we're still waiting to hear uh, from the cleaning company on whether or not that that one sort of innovative cleaning procedure is going to be working. Um, and then, so forgive me, I'm trying to fill in for Lisa, but she knows way more than I do. Um, but we have a lot of properties that are occupied now 100%. Um, things are going much better. We have moved our maintenance team around. And like you know, we're hiring for Fall River Spring Creek, uh, but we think that you know, everybody's going to do really good at the properties. 
Um, we're also working on the landscaping company. We've got the bids in for that that I need to review so we can get landscaping going for the spring season. Um, it's like the, the Briarwood, are we having trouble to making that up? The four units available? You're reopening the wait list again? Yes, I, I think with Briarwood, some, we have one unit that just needs some paint. We talked about that this morning. We just need to repaint inside and do a couple small things and then that one will be ready to run to that one down if we need that one rented. Um, I think the Briarwood one is part of, since some of them are PDDs. Well, two of them just got done. Yeah. Oh, yeah, two of them. That's the reason why it's kind of on the higher side. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was trying to remember how many we had there. Yeah, we had two maps. Yeah, we had two. And then I think we had the, the other two that were recent, which means the main, some of the other okay. work that we need to do. So just coming out of mine and haven't been yeah. able to be rent on yet. I know one of the things that we talked about when we had those openings is um, talking to Jennifer Siebel and seeing if how we can get potential their clients in that actually qualify for housing for Delegate's community project mm -hmm. because that also can help Excellent. manage the property. Mm -hmm. um, but we obviously have our rules to go through and how we do it. So uh, I know we've had a few conversations with this about who you have in these houses that you can allow transition to mm -hmm. and so Who's the maintenance person over there? So that property gets split between Village on Main and Briarwood, so it's Patrick. Mm -hmm. And he just they just did the switch, all the all the maintenance team that, that did move from property to property did that on April first with Patrick taking on the supervisor role. So Lydell is at Spring Creek and I always get Spring Creek at some of those. Yeah. Ask them that I was neighborhood and senior. Um, Randy moved to the suites. Calvin's still at Lodge and Hearthstone. Patrick moved to Village on Main and Briarwood, and then we'll hire for Spring Creek Fall River. So I know that you guys have talked a lot about the flooring that was over there at Baskin Mountain Senior. Is there anything? Yeah. Is there anything up yet, I guess? Yeah, we're reaching a critical point. So I have four active insurance claims that we filed. One each for the professional liability and general liability policies on the installer, Palace, and the architect. Um, Palace has looped in the material supplier, so their insurance company is involved now as well. Um, there, we are looking internally about what steps to take to make sure we don't get too far down, too far away from that timeline to make sure something happens. I just spoke with Doug's fire risk manager yesterday, trying to um, say, uh, how do I get these insurance companies to move? How do we, how do we like fire and make sure that this is happening? Because we're having, we've got residents complaining, obviously family members of residents complaining. We're having, it's affecting Lisa, because we we need a plan, and so um, the materials supplier wants to try and talk about options as well because at this point we got to get something sorted so we've got a lot of, of um, there, paths that we're looking at there are there are timelines approaching um where we have to make we need to take certain actions and so we are working on taking those actions based on the timelines and so i think we're going to schedule uh an executive session with the Housing Authority Board on the 16th. So it's next Tuesday. We got to figure that time out. It may be good for us to do a joint executive session, and I'll see just how we can do that. We invite you all into it, but there's just deadlines coming, and we're going to take certain steps, which I actually do think will accelerate all the processes. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and I'm sorry being obtuse right now, but we're not in exact, so we can work together. It's getting serious. Yeah. I mean, it's been serious for a while, but now we need, we need 
people to move. So. Yeah, so operation at a given direction for attorneys to start repairing certain things, and I just need the board to convince her this. Any other questions on operations board? We're going to public health and safety updates. All right. Um, Start off with the, the security company that's at the sweeps, or mostly, you know, the sweeps and going around. Um, I'm added to that report. I feel like they're doing this, a really good job. Um, one of our residents at the sweeps actually called called in and thought someone was breaking into Zinnia, and that uh, was actually security. So, well, good. We met yeah, them with, our, with our guns out and security <laughs> saying no. Good right. response. Um, <laughs> But I'm added to those reports. I feel like they're they're doing a great job, um, making sure things are secure. We found open doors at Village on Main. Um, they're they're doing a really good job, and I think I talked to Chad daily. Um, and they also service a lot of other properties here in town, so they have a pretty good idea of like current trends and what's going on on the multifamilies. So, so how often do they get each of the properties? Is it once a week or no? They're 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 there every day. every night. Okay. Every night and on the weekends. So when we don't have staff on property, we have them going and, and checking. So we so we uh we had we tried building attendance. And building attendance wasn't working, so we, um, and then we had the vacancies in those building attendants, so we just eliminated those positions and we're moving that funding over. Um, and then we have to use, and then we have to use our so. fund balance over to carry us through this year, but then that will budget it in next year for the other properties. Um, it's, it was really interesting. Um, so when we had the situation that drove the decision, and Sarah can jump in on this, where we made the decision to pull security because there was literally threats and significant threats. And we saw the building do this. And then we ran out of money, or we didn't, we said, okay, we're not going to do this. And we pulled security and saw the building do this. I mean, and so direct correlation. And into just the the atmosphere mm -hmm. that was going. What was interesting, and, um, and I'll let Sarah jump in on this. I've seen them interact with people, and they actually get along really well with the residents. And so it's not like it's oh, I'm security, and I keep. They talk to them. They they. I mean, it's it's really this unique symbiotic relationship that they have with each other. That is interesting to see because when we initially when the previous LHJ had security there, it was completely different. And so for us, it really is, you gotta get the right company in mm -hmm. and how they work. And then I think part of what we were able to do is structure the contract to where we're looking at all our properties. So, yeah, um, so prior to this company um, and prior to the city, LH, LHA had security this week, which basically they slept on, on duty, the officers would find them, locked in a room, no one, you know, so just do it, and then if there is a key issue, that's, that would really, like, really spiral folks with keys and, you know, their mental health, and, you know, conditions, and people, more than one person say, oh, there's people in my unit. So long story, um, history there, but now with this company, they, they built those relationships when they came in, um, and, you know, they know, they know the players that are, bring people in the building, they check the logs, they knock on the door if they're there after the time that they're not supposed to be there. Now granted, do, do they open the door for them? No, not necessarily, but the resident knows, hey, there's there's peak, there's more eyes here. So I think it's been a tremendous help. Well, and they have body cameras. Mm -hmm. So in the interaction, we have body camera footage. And um, what's interesting is, and I had, we, I had Chad's number if I needed. If I didn't have Sarah, I could call him anytime and go, 
tell me what's going on. And they send detailed reports mm-hmm. every night of, of what they're doing and, and what, what they're seeing. And they've already helped us catch some situations that could have gotten really, really bad, really fast. And it was, a, it was a, you know, one was they see someone walking in with a gas can. You can't have a gas can in your units, right? So they're like, you can't bring this in. They then track the gas can down to the pergola where there was a smell of gas, which means they're probably doing something else. And then get the gas in the unit, which then led to this check to when we did the proper noticing and got in, they were probably making cookies. Probably. Well, it was a mess. It was. I, I don't know if they were, but it looked so. Talking to our our narcotic detectives, they they weren't so sold on it, but there was just too much indicia there to say that they weren't using it for drugs. So, but they were. It was security that alerted us to that. So, um, we never would have seen that uh, in our previous operations and you know again the advantage for us then is you deal with the issues in the front end versus letting them get to the point where you have like significant rehab you have to deal with and, um, so but anyway what's interesting is <laughs> this is something we're seeing now citywide is that um, like double digits of multifamily complexes that are now having to do the same thing. So mm-hmm. this isn't just affordable housing, no. this is yeah. even market rate housing where they're having to bring uh, security in. And it's not unique to Longmont. I mean, we're seeing cities from Fort Collins to South of mm-hmm. Denver that are now having to do the same thing because of, of all the challenges. So we need to, when we think of future projects, probably budget for it, and then the financing piece, and then uh, once we get the cameras in, um, they will have, uh, because this because city and suites, we need just move them there, we'll actually have access for all the cameras of all the properties at that location, so not only will we be there, they'll be monitoring the cameras uh, for all the properties. Which is great. Um, so security's working great. Moving on to meth. Um, Property Craft, the company that Laura mentioned, uh, reached out to them last week. Um, we're waiting for Lisa to get back. We're going to discuss next steps and um, you know where we're at with the cleaning on the one of the suites. They had a one of their um, basically the person that did a lot of the, the boots on the ground work. She quit. So now some of their, you know, executive directors are having to get involved. And so um, the plan is to meet with them either later this week or early next week to really dive in on where we're at and where we need to go. Um, this is the cleaning company? Yes, mm-hmm. Property Craft. Um, they're the ones that Harold, I think, explained in depth um, that they do a different type of cleaning, so it's not all the demo, right? Okay. Um, so that's that's good. We've got that rolling. Um, we've got two new meth detectors that um, one one is at Village on Main, the other is at the Suites, and monitoring those, um, getting some good good in indicators of some activity. So, you know, what, what do we do? Um, like the one at Spring Creek, we did test the wall. And so now it's like, well, are we gonna use property craft? And that's why we really need to get them to come and meet with us because we have some needs. Um, the batteries on the meth detectors, no problems anymore. They, they changed that platform out to this newest version and we are, we're in a, in a good place with that. Um, let's see, any questions on that piece? I mean, again, this is more preventative, more for us to see if these things work. We're, we're seeing this, that they are. So what's, what's the kind of next steps then that we want to do with the meth detectors? Well, I think Harold wanted to get some for the city bathrooms yeah. and really 
analyze that and and I tried to follow up with Doug on the cleaning of some of them so you, I think he had property property craft clean the memorial building bathroom and I do not know where they are with that but I think move into the bathrooms and then eventually you know so we were going to get Yes. We were going to get 22 or 23, <clears throat> put some in city bathrooms. Um, Doug, um, so Property Craft, our risk manager actually, he's the one that found it. And so we're going to put some in city bathrooms, and he was going to clean some of the bathrooms, not clean other bathrooms, so we can put some into cleaned areas and uncleaned areas to see kind of what, what's going on and what we're picking up. And then some of those we're actually gonna put in LHJ property. So have some that uh, once we uh, clean units, once we have a clean unit, then we'll put that in and we'll have a lease addendum for those units. Um, and then now that we kind of, so the battery issue was the only lingering thing. And we now know the battery issue is directly connected to some coverage. So if you have bad cell coverage, you're going to kill your batteries because it's constantly trying to connect. Um, I had a conversation with Greg, um, anyway, so he and I had a different conversation last week um, and he is interested in looking at those and, and maybe just installing them with Crystal too. Great, but oh, okay. just installing them on Christmas too as we get started because um, they're having similar issues in Christmas. Mm -hmm. uh, they just have two units that they have to clean. Um, and then kind of taking that approach then as units are cleaned or as we get through certain areas, then we will just start bringing them in. Um, putting them in existing units, we gotta be really careful because that can snowball on us in a hurry. So. Kind of just dropping in what's included. It's just kind of our approach. Have we ordered those 22 units then? Or is it still in process? We're waiting on the battery. Okay. <laughs> and then now that the batteries are there, then I think I'm good to go on ordering those 20 out. I just haven't had a chance to catch up with Sarah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so, so, Sarah, like, being the our activity or the activity that you noticed with a couple that have just been up in main areas. Like what's what's the like the bathroom? What what's the action plan when when we see that? Do like the the security get that information and tell people to like get out of there? Do we just note that public you know places are getting some dings for some concerning readings? Just you know like basically what is what's the plan? Think? So no security won't have anything to do with the um, the meth detectors or any of the you know alarm alerts we get. I think it's right. more so working with um, Doug Spike and, and risk on we're going to clean them, right? And what that looks like. And that's why this company, um, once they get kind of more settled in Longmont, will probably be who we work with. But that's, you know, we don't know that for sure yet. Um, and again, more preventative. Yeah. So that's. Gotcha. So it's not like a situation where, like, you know, in the, like individuals in the are going right? So yeah. it's just like general cleaning and preventative yeah. stuff that you're doing. Correct. It's like, and we're not going to use this as a tool to arrest people or anything like that. Yeah. No, I, I knew that. I was wondering, you know, if you see like, I mean, I don't know if the data is coming up, but yeah, you know, this person or you know, these two people, and you're pretty sure that they're associated with some of this info. It, like it basically if anything happened as a result of that. But. I think we're still working through that um, at, at a leadership level. Um, yes. Conversations are being had and I think just evaluating each situation will definitely be different. Correct. Um, and that's where we just need to have some protocols set for what we do. These things, yeah. are, these things are crazy sensitive and that's part of the challenge and so I think what what they're learning and what they're capturing from the market is kind of what's active use and what's not active use because literally somebody can smoke meth outside and then 
when it gets on their clothes and they walk by, it'll trigger it. Mm -hmm. right. and, and so that's a, but again, we're not using this from a criminal standpoint, and we're not even really using it. I mean, it's not like, oh, your unit test, I mean, it depends, right? So if you have a clean unit, and all of a sudden we have the addendum, and this thing starts going off, that's one point where we have to do, we still have to do it within fair housing rules and everything else and noticing and things like that. It's not like we can just act on it. Um, yeah. And so every situation is going to be a little bit different, but I think what, what we've heard from Dan is it's, it's really the um, minimizing people who will sign a lease that know that it's in there. I mean, that's the value of this, is is really um, saying this is in there, you need to sign the lease. And uh, I think what they're finding is that people won't if, if they know that that's in play. Mm -hmm. and, and in that case... They'll, they'll figure it out and do it out, like, do it outside. I mean, yeah. we're even seeing that with marijuana. Like, I mean, it's happening. We'll just throw it out there. You have residents that smoke marijuana, they leave the property, and they do it in public and take the risk of getting caught in public. But they are they know that they're violating the lease if they're smoking in their unit. So, for the ones that want to comply, right? right. <laughs> and I think, you know, I, I would say, I mean, we've had a lot of conversations with people recently, and I would say that and I don't know if the numbers of meth units are even going to show this, but you know, I would say 95% of the people don't want to lose their house. And so they're, they're going out and they're, you know, if, if marijuana is a medical issue for them, yeah, they'll go to a friend's house, they'll, they'll go out, they, they, you know, because they don't want to lose their house. And, and you know, there's another component of kind of, you know, it's interesting is, I kind of sit back and think, I'm like, well, why don't you just use that evidence? Because, you know, that's a different issue for us. Yeah. And um, because it doesn't create the damage of the smoke and the unit and these other things. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, while, and, it, and it's hard in Colorado, with the states that have legalized marijuana when you're trying to balance the federal regulations. Um, that exist on these properties, it's, it's incredibly hard to deal with because people don't understand those nuances. And it's like, man, if I were you, I'd just use evidence. And there's no way we would ever be able to figure that out. And, and you still get what you need from it. And I think that's part of kind of conversations. But yeah, it's, it's interesting. We've met a few that said, yep, yeah, I do it, it's medical. We leave. And they'll go smoke it in their car and they'll mm -hmm. do stuff and... Take, they're taking the other risks, right? right. But I'm, I'm not going to point them in a different direction. I mean, I'd rather them not use it in the in the property, you know? I mean, yeah. they're not affecting the, you know, anyone else's... I mean, smoking their car, they're not affecting other people and, you know, shared with them. I'm not saying that every, every building has shared ventilation, but... You know, you can definitely smell marijuana when it's a, a property like the sweets, right? So will it ever be uh, smoke-free the entire property? That's a hard one because... That's like their vice. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, you know, when you look at it and um, the property interior is smoke-free. The, the whole property is not. The campus is not. The campus is not because right. we have areas where folks can smoke. And well, we, we can't provide specific designated smoking areas per LIHTC rules, so we can't encourage it by having like an ashtray up in the patio area. It's, it's an interesting line, <laughs> and then at, certainly at PSH, like when we went down and did that Arroyo Village tour, they they had folio lot had ashtrays and signs and everything allowing smoking in their common courtyard. And I said, How do you get around my type rule? She says, if we don't let them smoke, 
they are going to really, really struggle. Or yeah. for those that, that have serious, you know, who know, it could be substance abuse, mental health, something that helps them cope. Um, so it's an interesting timeline. Yeah, that, each block at all. that's what I was going to get to. So we know, I mean, part of the work that we do, I mean, we brought Recovery Cafe in, and, you know, I have a lot of friends that have gone through different types of recovery, and they smoke, and they know it's bad for them, and they're like, yeah, but what I was doing is worse. And so we have to balance that, because, um, honestly, we'd rather them smoke out under a pergola than... Well, a lot of these properties we're seeing that are smoke-free, like Copper Peak, North Main, they they are smoke free campus and how how many how many people do you think are complying? Like when you drive up there when it's cold out, you can see the cars lined up and they're they're smoking in their car. But those are the few of that large community, right? So it is a fine balance. It's like pick your poison. Can will the trail be uh, technically smoke free? The what? The city trail? Like that's going to be city parks, etc. The Greenway Trail. Greenway, the belt, the Greenway belt. Uh, are you I'm, are you allowed to smoke there? Like while you're walking? Yeah. Who's going to enforce it? Sure. So you know, like, yeah. It's if you're out. In there's public, the principle of it, then there's the reality. Like if you're smoking marijuana and someone calls us, hey, there's someone in the Greenway, but you know, out in public, we're going to go to that, right? But cigarettes. Yeah, it's a classic. You know, the, the council's got really good about talking about this. And, oh, you want us to create this? Is it even enforceable? Because when we look at what we're responding to, it's like, we don't have time to go enforce smoking cigarettes when we've got all these other calls coming in. And the, count, the council's actually gotten better at really assessing enforceability versus just putting in a rule for the sake of the rule. And, uh, so, yeah. So, um, just wanted to um, point out, Lauren, if you get in the landscaping plans moving forward, I'd love to work with that on with you because I do see all the plans ahead of time for DRC and planning. But that doesn't mean they listen. Anyone listens to what public safety has has to say regarding like SEPTED and future problems and all that good stuff. Okay. So please keep that in mind. And then, last but not least, um, cameras. Hmm. I got an update yesterday from Chief Brown that um, the collaborative group. You already know this. Um, I just wanted to tell everyone we're. we're they came in way over what was reasonable. So we're kind of back. We, we still have options. I don't know what those are because I'm not oh, in it. Right. Okay. So I decided last week that um, where we are is we actually heard what we need now. So we didn't really know. No, no. So they're going to go out with a very specific bid on the video management system and the types of cameras, and we're going to leave that bid out for 14 days, and then we're going to close it. And we're going to move forward. Um, it, was, it was just a fiasco, and I just said, "Edit it. We now know what we're going to do. List the equipment that it's going to be given." Um, and so it will include the equipment and. Yeah, it'll and include, it's all and ongoing. Yeah, it'll include cameras and BMS and ongoing and all of those issues. So, so stay tuned. Yeah. Because <laughs> we also heard for your sake, Molly, we also heard that the cameras don't meet the federal requirements if we did it the way we were thinking, and so. So is this a sorry? This. Is, you're along for the ride. We're working in real time. Um, if it will be bid with federal yes. included, then yeah. we should be able to just reimburse based on that. Yeah, yeah, that's in exactly basic it. form. Okay, that's, it. that's, that's, yeah, that's yeah. why we made the decision okay. on the bid. The cooperative was bid under federal requirements, but they were 
essentially holding us hostage because they're one of the only companies that were bid under the federal requirements. And um, then we did some due diligence to check their numbers, and it was like 150,000 more per year. Mm -hmm. And we're like, yeah, we're not, we're not going down this road. So that's all I have, unless anyone has questions for me. I mean, as far as calls for service, um, we did have a, all of us worked pretty hard last week. We had a missing person from the suites, um, which we, we, we went. Um, and the big question was, would we do this for anyone else in our community? And, and in fact, we would if this, this person lived anywhere else in Longmont. We had a canine track. Um, we had drones out. Come to find out, the uh, sergeant that was running the drones took a break about five in the morning, went into the Sur or 7-Eleven down south, or Circle K, I can't remember which one. And the clerk was like, because ch we, we checked all the gas stations around the city. Um, and the person was like, yeah, she was just here. So lo and behold, she walked right in. So we were able to find her, and um, we placed her on a mental health hold for the reasons um, that she had left and so that was a I think till 11 o'clock or at least one morning work work up but it was really it really showed how LHA is working with public safety and um, doing their due diligence to in situations like that because I, I without having that conduit between um, myself and a property manager in public safety it prolongs things so we're able to do things in, I think, more real time and make decisions now versus waiting an hour, waiting five hours. So it was good. She'd been missing over 24 hours. Yeah. So that was a good, that was she good She's to run away, didn't she? Yes. But she'd never done that before, so that's yet one of the other reasons we had a lot of questions. So Sarah's position, I think we talked about it. Sarah's now officing at the DSC part of the time. So now she's not only doing the housing work, she's also um, tasked with coordinating parking, rangers, code enforcement, um, and bringing together kind of all of these issues that we've seen. So really, um, when we talk about Center of Excellence models, it's really we leading and creating a different center of excellence model that is more community-wide. So as we see issues, I mean, as I've seen traffic on one recently in Dr. P. So touching base with all of these folks and bringing them together to make sure we're working collectively um, and not managing our own individual issues in our mind. And so I think there's a really good tie-in to the housing authority because so many of the housing authority properties are adjacent to or near other city properties, and so we're really um, starting that process now and seeing how it works. And so there's going to continue to be an evolution in what we're doing. Um, you know, we think generally about crime free multifamily housing is, you know, understanding call volumes and what the impact is because, similar to what we've done with Green Core, we may need to look at more resources into that world because that may help us again. Um, announce a prevention is working out of here, and so where we're really placing our resources is something that's now from the city side starting to circle in my mind because I know we have a lot of private multifamily complexes that are dealing with the same issues, and how do we kind of collectively start working in the same way with each other? Um, because ultimately, that will drive down calls for services and community if we're able to do that. So, things that we'll be looking at thinking about over the next two to three budget years. Any other questions? All right, any updates from the executive director? Covered? Covered it all. Unless you all have any questions for us. <coughs> On the vouchers, if someone gets evicted, that automatically lose the voucher. Um, and not it necessarily. Depends. It 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 depends
So I just stumbled into a case last week that wasn't an LHA, it was a marketplace, but they were using an LHA voucher as it turns out. And the concern was whether they would lose the voucher. And the input that I had was that if the case was suppressed, even if they were evicted, then they wouldn't lose the voucher. Is that true? That's what we're seeing. Yeah, that's what we're seeing. Yeah. So what we do, well, we just made the change last. It goes into effect in August. Yeah. So we made a change because one of the things that we're seeing with our voucher holders is, so let's say you pay $25 a month as part of what the voucher dictates. We're literally seeing people run evictions on voucher holders for $150 because we're paying the majority of rent and they're not paying their small fees. So there's a change coming in that gives us the ability to try to help manage that a little bit. And so there have been cases where um, people have been evicted, we've been made aware of it, and they didn't lose their voucher because it wasn't something that was would require the voucher to be removed. So in particular, this particular case, I got I don't know about this one. Um, the question was, it was a substantial violation. However, the record has been suppressed. It wasn't, you guys making a decision that it was the outside. So that, so that may be different than it depends, because sometimes we do know about it because then the, uh, we have property managers we have good relationships with, or that they talk to us. And so in the case, if the property manager said, Here's what's going on, and it's a substantial violation. And under the HUD rules, it triggers that they need to lose their voucher, then they will lose their voucher. So, the concern that I have is that the attorney is telling them not to They've been told they're going to lose it if on the record suppressed. Because technically, we're not supposed to know that that existed, even if you find out for a third party like that. Technically, the record is suppressed, so it's not supposed to know that. I'm it's kidding. My concern is when we're telling people the wrong thing. It's when when they do um, annual recertifications, they'll pull police records, which if this is suppressed, it doesn't. If it's not impacting their their background check, then it wouldn't trigger when they're doing their recertification of the voucher. But if it is something that it would have a record outside of just their their landlord record then it, that's what yeah. we would have to see so if as i understand crime free they don't have to be convicted um no so they so this the, due to the laws changing so it depends on what what it's for what is the arrest for and you're right property managers are not um unless it's drug related i'm not seeing 10 days given just for uh, an assault charge but if it's drug related i'm seeing a 10 day without a conviction and because a conviction is going to take who knows how long it takes six months a year depending on what it is so if i understand what you just said they would, they would pick it up in the recertification if they were found guilty Mm -hmm. What if they weren't found? What if they were found not guilty of the cases forward? I'm only concerned because I, I'm, I'm a little concerned that if we're telling people that it won't, it won't, you know, if it's suppressed, it won't generate an eviction, and it turns out it does. And technically, we're negotiating deals here that aren't, aren't enforceable. I think it depends on the situation because if it's the one I'm thinking of, there's something else at play rather than just the eviction. So we should probably talk about it. Yeah, that's a hard piece because they're all so specific. Um, I can generally guess, but not always. And it's the circumstances of the situation that that comes into play because 
So a lot of times what may happen is you may have an addiction occurring because of lack of payment or whatever it is, but tangentially connected to that, there's other issues that are triggering problems with the voucher themselves, whether it's failure to report income, failure to report other people living in the household, all of these other things that then actually triggers the, the, the loss of the voucher, but it's not necessarily the eviction, but it's the overall process that brings those things out in terms of how, how you deal with the situation. So, and that's the criminal check and some other things. Oh, I'm sorry to take a lot of time. No, that's fine. So if it gets, let's say the landlord agrees that if the person moves out in 30 days, they'll vacate the eviction. Will they still be on the hook to lose their voucher because the reason, the only reason for the eviction was a criminal arrest? Because what you're telling me is they can pick it up and the recertification and still happen. I What you're saying is it really is the time of the eviction. Time so two time separate occurrences. Yeah. And she had to move. I mean, I had to. She had to move because she no longer had a voucher and couldn't pay the rent. So she lost the voucher. Yeah. Okay. So she was on the hook for that. So in the case that I was involved with, even, even if they wanted to evict him, he still had risk to lose his voucher because he had he had been arrested. Yes. And they're under the crime tree program. But I mean, there's other times where we've had a situation where we've actually done the other side of it, where we were having challenges with an individual in a project-based voucher, and we needed to go through that process, and we did, but we actually facilitated a housing choice voucher for the individual for another location because it was really, the circumstances were more localized. And so it, it's a hard question to answer because everything is so specific to the individual situation and, and what they're doing because um, we do try to do that because we don't want people to be in house but sometimes you have people in certain locations that is the location that is creating the issues and so what you try to do is then facilitate them to be in another location in order to be successful so it's a hard question to answer um, because we've done it the other way. And, um, and then every agency is different. So that's part of the challenge is, I mean, here you have LHA, you have BCHA, you have VHP, and apparently Well County that are, that are having vouchers here. And every one of those organizations has a different tolerance level in the work what they do. And so, yeah. I would say the simple answer is call us, and we would be happy to talk about specific situations. Because I've seen it all over the board. And sometimes, like, there will be, like, a criminal act that we're notified of. But when you look at the reports, which the reports are public, you then find out they have people living there that aren't supposed to be living there, which then creates a different problem because then they're falsifying the documents that are making a determination on how much money to get. Um, because that's also based on the people living there and the income that those people are making. And I see that. And that's a different issue because then that just triggers a different process. So.
Clear for what? Uh, yeah, it's kind of unexpected, but I'm just a little concerned about what people are being told. You know? um, I don't think you can blanket say you're not going to lose your budget. Well, that, I know that, that's kind can. of what they're being told. Yeah, I think what we'll do is, when we're not, we'll, we'll talk about understanding specific circumstances. Yeah. And I think what I would say to like Susan and others is if we're in that mediation world, it's okay to just go, hey, here's what we've seen, you know, what do you think? And, and we can give a more clear answer to each individual situation. Next on the agenda, any other business? Oh, I did have one report. I did have a good conversation with Congressman Hughes. Um, last Thursday. Yes. Yeah, I last Thursday. Um, about uh, the funding that we've been receiving for HCD vouchers. And so he wants to get involved in that yeah. and, and start figuring it out. So um, Eric will yeah, set a meeting with his eight year and then we're going to start working that through um, his office in terms of additional funding. So I just want to throw this out and maybe get some guidance here. The shopping route that we do, so we've been at it now for about a year and a half, and we have been to the suites twice, and nobody's been there. So I'm wondering if we could <clears throat> just take them off the list because unfortunately sometimes the drivers who seem to think that they have to go down there anyway just in case somebody's waiting, which is not what we really do, then that costs us. <clears throat> now I know that Mayor Peck was definitely, her concern was not to include them with anyone else. Um, so can I thought of some things that maybe we could kind of look at differently, but take them off of that list. That preset driver up there at two o'clock, so he can do other routes for Via that don't come back on cost us. Or would you rather we wait till the end of the year? We've been two full years in it. Or we have a coffee conversation there tomorrow. We could bring it up and gauge interest, and maybe the, the people are just not as aware. To see if, if how long has it been? How long has it been since I've had anyone utilize it? Pretty close to a year. So we've never had anyone. We had one person go one time. We've had a couple of people who have signed up, and they're never, they're never there. Um, it's the same lady. Um, and so I know if her name shows up on the list, our chances of her being down there are, are very slim. We do check to make sure you know with whoever whoever's there if we can get an answer um or have it be a call and, and now there will be a manager there which will help because before it was you know, not always there so in this situation we have issued a notice like hey no show two times in fact i'm not even sure the person is still there i don't know but it's just a thought. I mean, we can go through the end of the year with it still showing up yeah. on our sheet of paper. Um, I think we need to figure out how we do that in a better way. I mean, if, if we've never had anyone in a year, then I would say, hey, we need to cut it. But then maybe we need to do some more to say, if you need it, then you need to let us know and figure out how we facilitate it. It just doesn't make sense for us to keep paying for it if they're not there. And I know we're communicating with. I mean, I've seen the, the list. Mm -hmm. So, we got an October, we have Zinnia coming on my two. So, and they change the date. Same little money now? And then see? Yeah. Operate in and make my money. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about it tomorrow. And kind of see, and you know, the other thing that we don't know is where um, how the micro is going to impact it because 
when you look at different demographics, different, different demographics are used to different things, and some things are more reasonable than other things are. And, you know, I think the one thing that, that we are seeing, at least as I've seen it personally, is I think um, most of the folks that I've interacted with at the sweeps are pretty proficient with technology. Sarah, would you agree? I would. And they may be more apt to use microtransit because it fits their schedule and what we don't know is some work, some don't work. And I mean, it could just be the, the time doesn't fit that location based on their life schedules, whereas the life schedules and some of our age restricted units are, are different because they may be retired and other issues. <laughs> so it may be that microtransit is actually the solution for that area once it wants to get started. So, um, well, you mentioned too, uh, the seniors consider it also a socialization time too, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So it's just a different community too. Okay. But yeah, I agree. I think we need to do something different. It's just, and maybe we can facilitate call and ride. Maybe if we're not doing VM or saving money, maybe we look at facilitating and giving them the call and ride information that they need and then they can use that. Because um, and, and that there's a small fee, but if if the people that are calling, they're signing up or disabled, mm -hmm. and they're not going, well then Accessorize is free for them. Mm -hmm. So it may be that Accessorize is what we need to use um, to fill that gap. So, let us get with Phil and, and kind of work through options and then we'll bring those back or ship those to you. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. That's the other thing the micro transit vehicles will be ADA. Mm -hmm. so. so, business as usual until we can otherwise. Okay. Well, no, I think if, if nobody signs up, don't go. Go. And no. if someone does sign up, I think it's perfectly acceptable for the vehicle to call ahead. They do. And say, or the driver. And maybe Johanna can reach out to the resident and remind them. What we'll do on our side is make sure that there's somebody there, whether it's Johanna or somebody, that there's a point person that they can talk, talk, talk that. Mm -hmm. And if they're not there, then we'll just go, we'll do it that day. So let us figure out operationally how to help this month. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think we might agree with you. We don't need to pay for it. We're not using it. Any other business? Let's adjourn at 1040. Thanks, everybody. Sarah, will you come over here real quick? Sure. What does your day look like? Oh. Well, I mean, <laughs> today? Yes. Well, I